on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. You sacrifice your soul on the altar of this self-perceived success. And you keep saying it's for everyone around you and it's for everyone around you, but really it's to solve this identity crisis and issue. You really don't know who you are and you really don't like who you are outside of the achievement and the accomplishment. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. Today, I've got Cody Jefferson on the King stage. My brother, how are you? Dude, I'm doing well. Listen, that was, we've had a little conversation before this, and that, like, on radio voice you just did, <laughs> that was something special. Was, you like that? Saying. That sounds special. You need a radio show. <laughs> I had to, had to bring, had to bring the heat. You know, it's funny because uh, for a long time, I've had some people, you know, your voice, you know, but you know, what I was going to say was that you're uh, a bearded brother from another mother over That's there, it, you know? Listen, I feel like for there's so many guys who can't grow good beards. You know, it's like the beards that wish they could. We owe so it to them. If You have to, man. It's it's our cross to bear. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a tough one. It um, is, man. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people like to, it. <laughs> I'll have to send you some of our, we have a custom beard ball. I'll have to send you a, a can of it. Got yes. You. It's funny because the 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 more shows that I do, the more people I meet with beards, the more places I speak, it's like, man, it gets mentioned everywhere. Oh yeah. Everywhere I go. And it's like, man, I should be some sort of a, or make like you create a product. I mean, I'd be, I need to start maximizing this beard, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's funny, man. Like most of the guys inside of our community, you know, about 4,000 guys, like majority of them are bearded. So I don't know if it's like a, a, a like attracts like type of thing. Sure. I mean, dude, yeah. we, you and me, we both have flannels on right now. I know it's October. It's a, it's a Midwest thing. I think. Yeah, that's you true. I mean? yeah. 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 When I, that, I was just like going in my brain going, you know, backwards. I'm like, yeah, I guarantee you my dad has a flannel on today for sure. hundred percent. And my dad's got one on with a probably a Harley Davidson t-shirt. on. <laughs> yep. Just the way it rocks. And, and even Har- being Harley, like that's not in my lane. But like you said, it's like it's the same. It's the same cloth. We can use it for multiple, multiple uh, scenarios. That's it, man. Okay, tell us about Cody real quick. What kind of business are you in? What's the community? Give us the lowdown real quick. Yeah, yeah. So Cody Jefferson, listen, I do a lot of fun things, but first and foremost, the only thing that I care about at the end of this life is that you know that I was uh, the best dad that I could be to Stetson Foster Jefferson. So I get asked all the time, "What do I do?" Number one, I'm a dad. Outside of that, we've got a coaching and consulting company called Embrace the Lion. We started that in 2017. We help good men become great. Uh, Outside of that, I have uh, pushed into the business sector. So I sit on the board of five companies. I'm invested in six as we move towards exit. We've got just about uh, 480 million uh, in secured exits over the past five years that we've been a part of uh, walking with our founders and, and seeing. Travel the country a couple times a month, two to three times a month as a keynote speaker and MC. So that's a lot of fun. But uh, the the crux of that is I won't ever miss anything for my son uh, as best as I can. So I am on the PTA. I'm a homeroom dad. I am a nice. uh, wrestling coach, one of the baseball coaches. So for all the listeners who say they just don't have enough time, I would uh, say, show me yes. what you do. And I'll show you what is actually true about your schedule. That's right. You know, uh, well, I'm sure we'll get into this because it's it's part of just um, your message. But even recently, I've got young young kids. Yeah. But even recently, I had to make another adjustment, and so this one this one's really stretched me. I I end my day now at two, and three, for three for a guy, three, three to three fifteen. Three? Yep. Yeah, dude. Well, so like four. this is a big deal. Yep. You know, I, I'll work eighteen hours a day and love it. Dude, like it's like it's in my DNA. I love well, people. It. You don't shut it off. People don't understand. Like you don't. I, I get asked, like, how do you shut it off? You don't. You, you don't. don't ever shut it off. And I don't ever want to be the guy who says you should shut it off. But there right. does need to be a prioritization and a dance, 
right? There is no balance. Right. Like you don't, you don't create this. It's, but that's there's right. an integration yep. that can happen. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the right word because I, I guess I shouldn't say my day's done at two because my family time starts at right. two. It ends at seven when we're done praying with each other after we got to read the Bible. And then, and then I usually have an evening flow, you know, I, yeah. I come back into the office and, and, and then get my quiet time in, in the office, you know, things yeah. that doesn't require the phone or zoom. Sure. So, you know, I just, I just appreciate that perspective um, because, you know, we can, we can say things are important to us. Right. Listen, I was a pastor for 13 years. I mean, I guess I should say I'm still a pastor. The the <laughs> pulpit was just preparation for this platform that God exactly, had. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, you show me what you do. I, I've had people for 20 something years tell me what they believe, but you show me what you do and I'll show you what you actually believe. That's why for so many of your listeners, yeah. getting very, very clear on what you want and, and really leveraging those KPIs right. so that you can leverage time in a more effective way is so crucial now before you start stacking on zeros to your company and you find yourself over leveraged out of time because you never learned how to prioritize properly. Yeah, no, it's huge. A lot of, I think a lot of entrepreneurs learn that uh, they build their ship at sea per se, which is okay. Sure. Um, I think both of you and I probably um, have done that, but the reality is, is that it has to be done. Otherwise there is no leverage there. Right. The leverage is figuring out that yeah. and then obviously duplicating that into a team. Totally. Which is why, I mean, masterminds like yours or mine or whoever, they're so important because they can help you, you know, yes. you, you, you can't see the label of a bottle from the inside. So to be able to have that perspective from somebody like you or myself or someone else who can, who can speak to that leverage and speak to that prioritization and speak to, you know, the activities that are high leverage and the activities that might just be you being busy. So you can give yourself justification as to why you're stressed. hundred percent. Yeah. Cause we like that. We like that justification. I'm busy. Um, yeah. I'm getting things done or at least it feels like it. Um, okay, so I want to jump in here um, before we get to your story. Sure. I want to know at this level, like <laughs> you threw out some um, incredible stats at the beginning, some exits that you've been a part of and are a part of. You're building this yeah. huge community of men that want to yeah. become great. Why are you pushing? Because for all intents and purposes, you could probably just go be dad and and check the box for that one thing that you say that you're living the life yeah. for. Why are you pushing on everything else? Yeah, dude, money's set. And, and that's a really unique place to be in. When people say the money doesn't solve all problems. Ah, you don't make enough because it does <laughs> solve all problems. <laughs> you just that's to find why you don't have more. Um, man, I love what I do. I feel like I've been put here on purpose and for purpose and with purpose. Faith is at the deepest crux of my identity. And, you know, everybody asks, what's your why? What's your why? What's your why? Yeah. Well, it's not my son can't be so because I meet so many entrepreneurs who they say their family is the reason but they're overworking over leveraging they're not present right their kids don't even even know them they're in unhappy marriages but but it's all for my family and that's a cop out right so for me it is I can so I do yeah I've lost several family members close friends addiction suicide murder they, they will never breathe again. And I don't want to take any breath that I wake up with for granted. And I don't want to tell my son, like so many dads on the sidelines so celebrating things they did 20 years ago, overweight and can't do a thing about it with their kid, what they should do and how they should push hard. Right. I want to show my son, like, I'm not going to tell you to go chase your dreams if I'm not. I'm not going to tell you to go all in on something if I'm not, and I'm not going to preach a message of prioritization and that you can have it all if I don't. Yeah. So if I can, I do. I do. Love it. Mm -hmm. It's the, um, oh, I'm going to forget it now. I think actually uh, your buddy that we were just talking about, uh, Coach JC, um, I, if I can, I must, I must, I will. I, I can't remember the, the phraseology there, but it makes me think of that. Yeah. We're, we're full of, you know, we're full of euphemisms and yeah, well, you know, it's it, what it our, is. Our is big it, thing is this is who I am. So this yeah. is what I do. This is who I am. So this is what I do. It's not, this is what I feel because we go off emotions. Like right. if you're not happy in business, but you started a business to become happy, like your business is trash when you're not happy anymore. If you get in a relationship because you want to be happy, what happens when you're not happy anymore? 
So right. these things can't be based on emotional constructs. So it's based on identity. This is who I am. So this is yeah. what I do, which is why it's so important for your listeners and anyone, you know, pushing forward to really define what you want and who you need to become in order for that to become a reality, because it won't be about the goal that you achieve. It'll be who you become in the process. Yeah. So two parts there, just to summarize for the listener, you said not only identify what you want, but then specifically who you need to become. Yeah. And so talk about that from your angle, obviously with, you know, maybe in, in telling a little bit of your story, you, you were involved with being a pastor before. Yeah. How did, you know, embrace the lion come sure. out? Like, give us a little bit of the backdrop. Yeah. So let's jump into this. I jumped into occupational ministry at 19. It wasn't a call from God. It wasn't some burning bush moment. No dream on a mountaintop, man. Like I just went to, I wasn't even going to church. Um, I'd kind of rationalized my way out of religion. I did really well in school. I don't have that story of like, I barely graduated ninth grade and got kicked out of 10 schools and I'm an entrepreneur. Not it. I did very well in school academically. I could go anywhere I wanted at university. Uh, scholastically and academically, I was, I was the top. And so because of that, I just rationalized God out of the equation because I'm like all the rules. Ended up in a, and I grew up in a small Southern Baptist church, right? Which okay. didn't, yeah, <laughs> just only yeah. helped my cause. Exactly. And, <laughs> and so uh, I was managing a garage. I've been a licensed mechanic for about 20 years, licensed barber as well. Wow. And uh, I was wrenching on cars and the owner asked me to go to church. I'm like, that's not really my thing. So you want to go to, you want to go to coffee on a Saturday night? I'm like, well, I can get down with that. So we go get coffee inside of a church, big mega trip, like 5,000 people. I'd never seen anything like it before. Wow. Pastor comes out, blonde hair, long, rides a Harley, you know. I'm like, All right, I, I can, I don't I know this. Dig this guy. <laughs> I don't, like, I, I've never, wait a minute, what? Yeah. Um, we we hit it off, man. His name was Eastman Curtis. And, and we hit it off. He had a church called Destiny. And he put me in a position of leadership that I didn't deserve that I didn't earn. Like I, I really understood grace in that moment. Cause like, man, you've got, you've got a great voice. Uh, you, I played guitar really well. I mean, I was a professional musician for a decade yeah. um, through ministry and he's like, you can speak and you're charismatic on stage and man, listen back in like 2003, that's really all you needed to be a pastor in the mega church. So <laughs> theology what's that <laughs> uh, that's funny the, the real comes out <laughs> yeah i mean i'm just being just keeping it 100 man uh yeah. but through that those 13 years uh, i worked there i served the united methodist conference of oklahoma for eight years and then i worked at a, a church that was really about convergence theology so liturgical um, evangelical and charismatic so really fell in love with church history went to school wow. studied church history uh, but throughout all of this uh, I became an addict and I was addicted to affirmation. I was addicted to uh, people pleasing. I, I grew up not really knowing who I was. Um, I grew up in a bit of a broken home, really raised with my grandparents primarily and very grateful, grateful for my dad, grateful for my mom, grateful for my grandparents, grateful for everyone. Um, but you grow up and, and you don't really ever know who you are because everything is tied to what you do. Yeah. Well, I'm good at this. I can do this. I can solve like when, especially when you're good at solving problems for people, you identify your self-worth as your ability to solve problems for people. Right. And ministry just exacerbated that. And, you know, I grew up in a single bedroom trailer. Um, I grew up by a single dad who, I mean, we were just rubbing sticks together to make ends meet. We didn't have anything that the other kids had. And it's not that we went without things. It's just you, you grew up being called trailer trash. You grew up thinking like success or these kinds of things don't happen for people like me. If you actually right. knew, if you knew my parents were divorced, if you knew, you know, I went through this as a kid. If you, if you knew that sometimes I actually don't, I, I catch atheist flu like once a month. Sometimes I don't really know what I believe. <laughs> I can't tell you that. If you actually knew, you wouldn't want me leading you. So that right. led to this anxiety in this need to perform and this need to be a problem solver in this need to overwork so that I would make myself invaluable. So like, so I'm indispensable. Yeah. And the problem is, and that happens so, so much in the church that happens so much in business, right? It's part of the reason this company was formed is you sacrifice your soul on the altar of this self-perceived success. And you keep saying it's for everyone around you and it's for everyone around you, but really it's to solve this identity crisis and issue. You really don't know who you are and you really don't like who you are outside of the achievement and the accomplishment. Right. And so in, in 2015, I went through uh, a divorce 
no real great scandal or anything. I stayed in ministry. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was just, she wanted to do something different. Yeah. We had a one-year-old at the time, uh, over the course of walking through that divorce, still stay in ministry, still, you know, shaking hands and blessing babies and preaching on Sundays and leading worship on Sundays and yeah. leading men's group and liturgical formation and student ministry and men's ministry and traveling, doing all things. Yeah. Everything's fine. And then people start dying. I had an 18 month old niece um, that was murdered. I wow. lost an aunt. I uh, lost a, a best friend to suicide. I lost a sister in law to suicide. I lost a 19 year old sister to murder. And all this while walking through this. And everything's fine. Everything's fine. I'm a pastor. God's got a plan. Everything's good. You know, you put everything's that mask fine. on. Yeah. And, and my body just uh, finally just threw a middle finger up to me. And I went septic in late 2016. And I was unconscious for three days. I was in this hospital bed. I'd lost like 30 pounds. I'm, if, you're, if, if you ever look on me on social media, I'm about a buck 70 now, about 170 pounds. I'm five foot six. I'm, you know, just, I'm a towering uh, man, <laughs> uh, but I'm pretty built, but I was like 120, yeah. 125. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm in this hospital gown. Right. And so uh, I, I get up to go to the bathroom because I'm awake now, grab my IV tree. I try to close the back of it, you know, because I'm naked under it. And I'm like, I'm not trying to get any nurses to stumble in their walk. So I'm like yeah. trying to close the back up while I walk over to the bathroom. And I just look at myself. I'm just a shell, dude. Yeah. And I recognize in that moment, like nobody's coming to save you, bro. Nobody. You spent every day, every evening making hospital visits for 20 years. Nobody's here. And that's not an indictment on anyone. That is just like, if, if you give people enough rope, they'll hang you by it in your own need to self-perform and be all things and over leverage yourself. Mm -hmm. And I bet a lot of your listeners, like in some way you, you you've felt that before. Oh, sure. And I look in the mirror and I, I said the, the phrase that has become the mantra of our company, which is what needs to die in me to become the man that I said I'd be. Because is this it? Is this where you die? Your son doesn't know you. Right. What's he going to say when he's older? Yeah. Like, you know, my daddy, yeah, he, he, he just died overworking. Right. And, uh, you know, I miss my son's first steps working. Missed his first words working and his mom and I were in the house. Like I was working from home because I had a new baby in the church. Let me work from home. I was there, but yeah. I wasn't there. Yeah. And so at that point I recognized like this doesn't work. Over the over burying those friends, like I had buried three pastor friends who had taken their own lives due to their stress and anxiety. I've buried several more since. Jeez. I'm like something's got to give, man. Like something has got to give. We are all sacrificing our soul on the altar of this self-perceived success. We're like, what does it profit a man to gain the world and, and lose his soul? Right. And that's where Embrace the Lion started. Right. It was originally embraced the line of the tribe of Judah. Dude, that's a super long email you <laughs> So yes, you know? it is. yeah. ETL, ETL rolls off the tongue. ETL a is just a lot quicker. So <laughs> we uh I just started sharing my story, man. I, I stepped out of occupational ministry in early 2017, attended a conference two weeks later where I didn't know anybody. It was an entrepreneur conference. What and conference was it? What conference was it? It was called Meltdown in the Desert. It doesn't okay. it, there were, it happened for I think three years. Okay, got it. All right. And so here's how this works for all of you that are, that are taking notes. So I stepped out of ministry, okay, out of my salary, which into that, like my last salary in the church was $33,000, balling on a budget, if you know what I'm saying, That's you know what right. I mean? Yeah, right. I was. But I, I walked away from that. Uh, I, I stepped, it, there was no great, again, great relationship with church, still go to church, love Jesus. Like, I just really had this burden to yeah. do this. And I knew I couldn't say the things that I wanted to say and talk about things I wanted to talk about inside the walls of the church, too much politics. Yeah. So I go to this conference. I don't know anybody. And like I scraped to get there. This, yeah. I didn't have the six figures in six days everybody sells online. Right. I didn't have my seven figure in seven hours. Right. Right. Like I was flipping Harleys out of my garage. I was cutting hair out of the front room of my house. I was giving guitar lessons, piano lessons, vocal lessons, building websites, doing graphic design for local businesses. Cause when yeah. you're in ministry and you're young, they're like, figure out how to do graphics, figure out how to build us a website. So you just learn. So I'm taking all those skill sets, all the skill sets that so many of you take for granted are the ones that could catapult you into the success that you're looking for. Don't be too proud to use them. Yeah. 
-hmm. and don't overthink it either. Because the things that you're really great at that you take for granted are the things that people don't know how to leverage in their own lives. That's why we right. coach, so why we do the things that we do. Yep. So I go to this conference and uh, I'm, dude, I'm like two weeks out of ministry, like two weeks, like I'm fresh. You know what I mean? Right. I don't he's know a little baby bird. <laughs> Man, listen, I'm just trying to get a worm over here. You know what I'm saying? And That's so right. I don't know anybody. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have an LLC yet. I just know that if I can get in the right rooms, because I've done conferences in the church, like sure. big, like large 20, 40,000 member, like big conferences. I'm like, if I can get in the right rooms, I'll just run the pastor playbook. I will get to know everybody's story because everybody wants to talk about themselves. And I like, I'm going to, I'm going to homie up everyone. <laughs> and uh, so I go and I'm meeting everyone in the crowd. Like I'm meeting, there's like 300 people there. So I'm like, this is cake. This is like a youth rally. Yeah. I'm going to know so everybody. I'm going to, I'm no everybody, dude. I literally, I'm going to, I know everybody at this place. Yeah. And then the power goes out and dude, it's like, june in or july in phoenix so it's it's Oof, like yeah. hotter than hell yeah literally and so and we're in a building called galvanize which is steel and so it just starts baking inside there right it's like having tattoos in a baptist church like you're just getting <laughs> hot and <laughs> and so i go over to the the founder he's the only he invited me through facebook uh, cause he, cause my content at that time was going viral a lot. Um, back then it was really easy to go viral more so than now. Yeah. And I was like, Hey, what's the name of the hotel? Like, what's the number of the hotel? And so he gives it to me. So I call the hotel. I tell them that we need, uh, if they ask that everybody stay in there, do we have a conference room that'll host, you know, 350 people? Yes, sir. We do great. We need 350 chairs up there. We need two screens running, um, uh, AV to the back. We're going to pipe in through, a, a laptop we've already dumped everything onto it i need water downstairs and we need the shuttle to start coming to pick people up because it's getting hot no problem sir we'll, we'll get right on that i go down and tell the food trucks hey guys we're relocating over to this hotel this is what we're going to do and then i go up and tell colby who was the founder of the conference all these things. i was like this is what's happening this is what we're doing this is how we're moving people it's starting now and i'm going to go over with your av and we're getting everything set up upstairs we'll be ready in 60 minutes and he goes what who, who are, are you? you who is this dude <laughs> dude so i forgot I forgot I wasn't in church. <laughs> I, 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 it was two weeks, man. Like I just, I went default. So then I'm yeah. like, oh dude, I have ruined every relationship. I totally just ruined my name. And I like, dude, I was just humiliated. But then everybody started coming, dude, you're the guy that the pastor guy who like just fixed all this. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, but nobody can understand why I would do that without wanting something. Right. right. I was like, oh dude, I just, this is what I do. So the next day they got the power back on. We moved back. There's this older gentleman sitting at the table by himself for lunch. Well, what's Cody going to go do? Yep. Sit with him. So I'm like, Hey man, what's going on? He's like, hello, you're the pastor guy. I'm like, I'm the pastor guy. He's like, I'm a pastor. I'm like, get out of here. Look at that. Two peas in a pod. He's like, you should be on my podcast. And I'm like, cool. What's a podcast? <laughs> and I don't know, dude. Yeah. Um, and and he's like, well, we're just, I'm just gonna ask you some questions. I'm like, dude, that'd be really fun. I've never done that, but I've done a lot of interviews, like radio interviews and TV for the church. So I'm like, that, that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, when should we do that? He's like, let's do it right now. I'm like, okay. So we go upstairs and we sit down and he's like, do you have a bio? I'm like, no, what? Co Cody. No. <laughs> yeah, my name is Cody. Uh, he's like, it's fine. I know your story. We've talked. I know what you're doing. I love it. And so are you ready? I'm like, yeah, what do I do? He's like, sit down and stop pacing. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And so I put the headphones on. He's like, you ready? I'm like, I'm ready. He goes, hey, everyone, this is Alan Taylor. Welcome back to Entrepreneur Magazine, entrepreneur.com and Entrepreneur Radio. And I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. I'm in over my head. Yeah. What did I do? That went viral. USA Today, Today Show, like started everything so two weeks ago yeah al and i are and al has become one of my closest friends he is pioneer awesome. he's cheered me on and been such a pioneer for my entire movement from the yeah. beginning yeah and so we were together a couple of weeks ago if you saw the picture on my instagram or facebook uh he and i are interviewing tim tebow because we were with tim tebow's foundation That's in awesome. san diego a couple of weeks ago we raised uh, four million dollars for his charity so um what a full circle moment but yeah Seriously, you know, putting yourself in the, in the right rooms. That's how it all started for me. Um, I didn't really, I didn't have some great business plan. I knew that I wanted to help men in a very specific way Yeah. and there wasn't a roadmap for it. So I created it 
much like I've got a really uh, a dear friend, Garrett White, who uh, has a movement. It's a little bit more intense than mine. Um, but the same, you know, he didn't, he didn't set out to create something to save everyone else. It was to save himself. Yeah. And that's how this started. So we've got four pillars, head, heart, health, habits. I feel like everybody's got their four pillars and <laughs> kind of contingent to have a men's movement. You got to have the that's four. Right. You yeah. got to have four, not gotta three, four. not seven. Nope. Nope. You got to have the four. And it's just been a, it's been a wild ride ever Good since. Stuff. And, and it's gotten so it's grown so fast. Yeah. Um, it's got to be God. I'm good. Right. And I'm, I can talk and I, I can lead things and that's all I've done for my entire life, but I'm not that good. God has had his hand in all of this. Yeah. Well, I, pres- I appreciate the perspective. The story obviously is just yeah. super encouraging. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> through that, what I pulled out, um, like you said, was getting in the right rooms, yeah. shaking a hand, not being afraid to meet people, like all of these things that we normally hear in business, but that came full circle for you in just one event one event listen you know my my entire career thus far has been built on a couple things one is that we are a culture that is desperate to be known but we will settle every day for being seen mm, so when explain you that see, what do you mean by that well look at social media look the way that we live yeah we want to be known. we we want to be loved we want to be valued we want to be championed Right. We want our potential to be pushed in healthy ways and appropriate ways. This is why yeah. men need accountability and community. This is why men need brotherhood to belong to. That's right. right? Because iron sharpens iron. Right. Most of us don't have that. So we'll settle for being seen. Look right. at these perfectly posted pictures on social media. Look at how I look from the outside in. Right? We'll settle for being seen. We'll settle for attaboys. We'll settle for, how are you? I'm good. Doing great, man. Just living the dream. Right. But at our core, we want to be known. We want someone to sit down with us and not say, cool, man, what do you do? Right. As an intro, but do what makes your soul come alive? Yeah. You got kids? Tell me about your kids. You'll find that it, if anyone listening, if you meet me in person, which is not hard to do, I'm, I travel quite a bit. I want to ask you, my first question will not be what, what you do. Right. Is tell me what makes you come alive. Tell me what makes your heart dance. Tell me about your kids. If you got kids. Right. People deserve to be known. And people are really looking to answer three questions. I don't care what vertical you're in. I mean, if you think about it, and, and I learned this as a pastor, is that people are looking to answer three questions. Is it possible? Do I have permission? And will you go with me? It's huge. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, thinking about even just <clears throat> whether it's a, a professional relationship, a brotherhood, even with my wife, mm-hmm. those three things uh, I, I think apply. Yeah. You, it's interesting that our kids. Everyone. Oh yeah. Ex- yeah, exactly. I, I just, it, well, it's cause it's purposeful. And, yes. and as a man, um, that's what, that's what we need. Some more than others on the permission side, some just jump sure. a little easier than the others, but the, the camaraderie, the, will you go with me piece? Um, I think whether they admit it or not, every listener out there is going, mm-hmm, that's right. Because it's respect. It's respect. And do we all want somebody to say, we listen, inherently, we want to be on a winning team. That's right. We want to win. And we want someone to, so many men never move forward because they surround themselves with the same circle that they've had their entire life. They never ascend right. beyond it. One, because they don't know where to go. Right. Yeah. But two, it's familiar. And the brain always prefers the path of familiarity. And that yeah. creates a lid. So if we're all earning the same, I can't earn more than you because then what you're going to think I'm better than you, or you're going to think I think I'm better than you. And then I'm going to have to diminish what I'm doing so that I don't like, yeah, it doesn't seem like I'm being arrogant. And right. so then maybe I just don't, I don't go any further than where I'm at because I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. I don't want to rock the boat right. or because nobody ever tells me I never know more is possible. Right. I hear a podcast like this and I hear two guys who are successful talking and I think, yeah, but I don't have anybody like that in my corner. Right. And exactly. all it takes is filling out an application saying, Hey man, I'd like to actually learn more about what it would look like to be inside a circle like this. Yeah. 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 You're right. Because, um, that wind, that momentum, yeah. just the idea of having the wind or the momentum can put us into action that, um, that we never knew that was possible for ourselves, yeah. even, you know, our own belief yeah. and then the action and then the more belief and then the more action and then the more belief, um, right. that always follows. I want you, you have, obviously you've just, you've got your story. You've got, you know, all these things that have been such um, influential things, even here on the last, you know, 30 minutes that we've been talking. 
Yeah. I want to flip the script here okay. in, in your business. Sure. You've given us so many different things that have worked. Tell me about a situation or maybe even a, a mistake or a bad decision, something that didn't work that you had to correct from. How many do you want? <laughs> Just one. Well, first one that pops into your brain. Yeah. Hiring the wrong people for the job. Interesting. Okay. So um, hiring people that are good at a lot of things rather than being great at one or two things. Okay. Uh, Specialist we, versus generalist. Right. So we, we could have gone further faster. Uh, and, and that's not to say like, there's a lack of gratitude for where we are. It's totally. just, you learn over time that <clears throat> hiring for a specific skill set that is required right. is far more useful than hiring based on somebody's personality and wanting to train them. Like we just don't train anymore. So we have solid SOPs. And anytime someone comes into any of our organizations, like there's a very, very clear line of responsibility and role and KPI yeah. versus, you know, are you just fun to be around and you get the culture that's important. Right. Sure. But more than that. Uh, some of the mistakes that I made early on was, you know, hiring generalists, generalists that I thought could cover a lot of ground, yeah. which we did, but we didn't grow in the ways that we could have early on sure. uh, because I was, I didn't understand the value of really, really tactical precision right. in, in filling positions. Would you, would you agree with that? The majority of, I guess, maybe startups, because obviously that's what, uh, you know, ETL is a startup or just maybe smaller businesses that are maybe listening today that aren't at the seven figure mark or above, would you maybe agree that there has a, there's a phase that you go through with a generalist, you as the owner are a generalist, obviously you're doing yeah. everything, but then you yeah. have maybe one or two others mm -hmm. or maybe three before you really hit that level of like, okay, yeah. now we need that one specific talent doing this one specific thing. Is that kind of right. like a, just a, like a, you have to step through that anyway, no matter what? I think you have to, I don't, but well, one, it's a resource conversation. So, sure. you know, there's always going to be gaps that keep you from like that really kind of proverbial next level. And there, sure. you know, Grant Cardone talks about breakpoints. Right. And I was with him a couple of weeks ago and he broke this down and it was really, really phenomenal. And so I'm really happy to be able to share kind of some of that insight from somebody who runs, you know, multi-billion dollar organizations, but that zero to two mil, your, your margins uh, are probably fine but you, you don't have the resource to be able to bring in those real heavy hitters. And you don't really even know what you need because you're just starting to get to where success might be feasible and possible. Right. Right. And so you have some VAs, uh, you might hire, you know, somebody to build funnels or to, you know, build out your CRM, something of that right. nature. And, and I'm speaking specific to kind of more our industry. Yeah. yeah uh, exactly. But even in any, in any startup, I mean, really, you're looking for someone to, to handle those kind of lower income tasks that a generalist can. So even if you're a brick and mortar, you're hiring somebody to take, you know, items out to someone's car or to, yep. you know, fill out paperwork and you're going to sit there as a receptionist. Like, so these are general positions. It's not until you really get to that three to $5 million range and above where you really have to start looking at, okay, are, am I going to remove myself as a business owner and function more as a CEO that yeah. is over culture, people and finances, right? Versus right. all of the, and then source out everything else that needs to be done on a daily basis and track that through KPIs. Um, that's really when you have the resource and you have the proven track record now through your revenue to be able to make those hires. Because again, just because yeah. you have a great month doesn't mean that you go blow that on someone because you don't have the, you don't have the MRR that proves that this is actually sustainable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's no history there. And you're right. Uh, there's, there's, there's those you know, breaking points and some along the ways there and key roles that have to go in the transition that you described. Um, we use the language of warrior to King, right? The warrior yeah. is that zero to 1 million, maybe a little yeah. over yeah. That, that warrior King a little bit, but that warrior who's in the business doing the tactical doing it themselves, right? They haven't removed yeah. them or their mind. Um, and then the king is full, full blown. I have to work on. I have to become the yeah. facilitator. I have to become bigger than just me, team, buying back time for my family, obviously right. taking care of my church, my community, all the people, the way to the crown, if you will. Yeah. Right. So I, I love how you, from a business perspective, laid down. This is the exact transition that we go through 
in a business, male, female, whatever, but mm-hmm. it's also kind of how we go through as men, right? Yeah. We go through the same transition. Uh, John Eldridge breaks this down in, in Fathered by God, right? Cowboy or boyhood, cowboy, warrior, king, sage. Absolutely. Like, these are the stages that we go through. Like, and we have to continue to progress and our mindset changes. Yeah. Well, and you know, even look at a hero's journey, or if you look at, uh, you know, falling upward by Richard Rohr, where he talks about the two halves of life, right? The one is about proving, 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 proving. And then there's yeah. something inevitably that happens that leads us into the second half of life, where he would say that true spiritual contentment or contentment as a man is when there's nothing to prove, hide, yeah. or protect, right? Interesting. So you move into more of that, that sage. Territory. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. a, there's this mature perspective is really yeah. what you're right. You're saying. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's not, it's no longer about, um, like you said, earning or maybe proving that you're worthy as the king, but but hey, like I've done it already. This is, this is who I am. This is what I do. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's who I've been designed to be. It's who I was. Right. It's who I am. Love it. Okay, what kind of um process do you have around decision making? We've kind of tossed around some good and bad decisions here. What would you say for the listener? Do you have a couple of steps that you take if something comes across your desk? Are there people you talk to? What's your process for decision making? Yeah, so I have mentors and coaches in my life, and I have a a band of brothers, uh, a close group of four horsemen in my life that um, okay. we are we are incredibly close. And and I will I will go to them uh, just they would go to me, and you know just. Again, it's it's hard to read the label of the bottle from the inside. Sometimes I've gotten pretty good at being able to make analytical decisions and removing sure. any emotional contracts that might happen as a result of that. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't mean that I don't want you know eyeballs on this that are far more qualified than mine. Sure. Especially when we talk about you know invest so investing in companies or right. if I have proposals that come across my desk, um, those are more the high level decisions and decisions that that I'm looking at that require obviously capital and funding. And th- that I would want other eyeballs on in terms of the, like my company or any daily business decisions that come across my desk for the 98% of those, uh, this is just a very logical process of looking at the weighted pros and cons and does it fit into the vision of the company? Does it fit into the culture? Does it fit into, you know, our, our year long projections? Does it fit into a five-year projection? And, you know, if it's a higher, you know, does, does this person on paper have the right qualifications when we, you know, go through two or three zoom interviews, do we feel like this person is the most appropriate for our culture and for the positioning? And and then we go from there. So, um, yeah, for me, it is again, when they are large investment decisions or decisions in take, like I take equity in companies uh, after I've coached for a specific uh, amount of time, usually one year for moving towards exit. And it makes sense. Uh, so looking over, obviously I'm going to get the the eyeballs of my attorneys on those. Sure. And so yeah. there are yeah. far yeah. more qualified eyes rather, you know, handshake goes a long way in Oklahoma, um, <laughs> but it only goes so far. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, I think we can all appreciate those things. And and I think the bigger that you get, the bigger, the decisions, the more specialists, the more qualified, the eyeball, yeah. we, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Transitioning here. I want to know talking about trackables, right? Like you've mentioned KPI a couple of times yeah. thinking about your business. Okay. What is the one thing that if you could only pick one thing to track, what, what would that one thing be? Mm. this is a really great question so if we could only track one thing it would be fulfillment okay in terms of the personal professional film fulfillment of our guys because if our guys are because we track all of this on a weekly basis like we have forms that all of our guys fill out every single sunday and then our coaches look over them, our one-to-one clients I look over, and we, we have a sliding scale from physical, emotional, financial. We look at KPIs in business because all of our guys, uh, for the most part, especially on a one-to-one level, are running companies that are 5 to $150 million. Sure. Um, so we're tracking a lot of things. But if you are not finding fulfillment from within, you'll look for it everywhere else. And that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you're going to look for that happiness in the business. And then when things aren't going well, that's going to lead to anxiety, depression, frustration, and overwhelm, which is going to lead to withdrawal and isolation and sedation and all right. of those things and that bleeds into your family, that bleeds into your staff, that bleeds into community life that bleeds everywhere. Yeah. So, so I, I I'm actually hearing, um, I'm hearing your trackable, but then I'm hearing two trackables for the listener, because I would assume that if it's, that's your trackable for your guys, which, you know, a lot of which are business owners, then they should be tracking that. My listeners should be tracking fulfillment. But then what I also heard you say in the in you specifically, Cody, tracking fulfillment, really what you're gauging is the health of your client experience. Yeah. And so would you like, is that is that the language that you're giving to the listener here is, of course, you got to check your fulfillment, like you personally, because if you're, yeah. if you're but, dried yeah, up. But we also, yeah, but then we also have to look at how we're fulfilling with the client. Like, are we, right. are we walking close enough? Uh, are we, are we're not done for you, right? So we walk with right. you, but are, are we walking in a way that's appropriate, that is meaningful, that is impactful? Like if yeah. we look over the breadth of our of uh, our our forms every single Sunday, like are we seeing a measurable trajectory upward? Yeah, yeah, love that. Um, what book would you recommend for a six figure business owner? Man, woman. Yeah, just a. Uh, uh, I was uh, gonna you, say, like for for men or for yeah. anyone, you need to read As a Man Thinketh. Um, Great book, yeah. absolutely. But if you haven't, uh, a book that I think every I'll give two books. Let's get like just yeah, let's really go deep into it. Let's get <laughs> <laughs> like let me just give away the farm. Yeah. Uh, so one, As a Man Thinketh. Uh, yeah. Two. Uh, you should read Traction by Gina Wickman. I just think it's a great foundational book that everyone in business should probably memorize. And then yeah. third is uh, my buddy Alex has a book called $100 Million Offers, Alex Hormozzi. Yeah. And that book uh, has been uh, absolutely transformational for, I mean, just tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. It's a young dude who has created an insane business acumen. And the way that he breaks things down in that book is inspiring and applicable and tangible. Yep. And so everyone would be do would be doing themselves a favor to to read and apply that book. Yeah, I agree uh, on all of the above. The business acumen there. Um, I'll watch him talk about topics that I already understand and already and um, like already fully get, just to hear how his brain thinks. Um, well, and it's so fascinating how he can articulate something in 30 seconds. And I'm like, man, yep, you're smart. <laughs> yep, that's all I that's, got. That's all I got. <laughs> we need guys like that. That's good that, that he, can, yeah. he can dissect things. Yeah. Um, okay. What do you think about intentionally networking and masterminding? That's my normal question. For you, okay. obviously, you know, getting around a community, obviously, is how you built your business. So yep. quick plug here for, for your community, but really what's the power behind when I say to someone networking or masterminding, what, what is it? What's the power? What's underneath all of that, that, that maybe you're delivering that someone doesn't have in their life currently, maybe listening that they don't have in that community feel. Yeah. So, so let me not plug my community. Let me actually talk about what it means for me and being part of a community. Perfect. So I've, I've, I've got masterminds that I'm a part of that are outside of my mastermind. Sure. And the proximity to people who are at and above where I am in success in, in yeah. different areas of life. Right. There are people who have been married 60, 70. I want to know about that. Who have raised incredibly successful, well-rounded, articulate, purpose-filled, joy-filled, like authentic kids who are now adults. Yeah. I want to know all about that. People yeah. who have built incredibly successful companies and have created healthy marriages and those healthy kids as well. Right. I want to learn from you. Yeah. Uh, so being in those rooms, it, so long as you're teachable, so long as you're open, so long as you're coachable, so long as you recognize that there's always something for all of us to learn. I never want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to be somewhere like in the top middle, right? I don't want to be the dumbest guy. Uh, <laughs> nobody, would, nobody likes that guy. Um, so... But also, you know, even if I think about my close network of friends, if I think about like my my best friends, if I think about Garrett, if I think about Keith Yaki, if I think about Los Silva and Josh Snow, if I think about these guys who have built these amazing companies and amazing lives, like 
success is normalized in every area and it's expected. Right. And you rise to that level or you don't because we're not required to be friends. We're not required to be in a network together. We're not required to do things together. So to me, like there is this really, so the the hard part about um, potential and maybe for a lot of your listeners, it was for me. I grew up in the church and potential was always something I needed to live up to. And I didn't even know what it was, dude. It was like, yeah, I would, I started playing piano at like seven. And so I was doing gospel singing conventions by nine and like playing from a grandparents. And, you know, I was the kid who could memorize all scripture. I could do all the things, you know, and it was, God's got such a big plan for you. God's got such big plans. God's going to do such big things. What do you even do with that as a kid? Right. Like that led to a lot of insecurity for me. And again, trying to prove that I was worth something to God. And it led me to overworking and like overstimulating, burning everything to the ground because I just like, I was, I did not know what that meant. Sure. Yeah. And it led to such anxiety and always feeling like I was letting God down in some way. Yeah. Like what, like I, if I stop working, if I don't like, am I, is wait, but potential, like, am I letting God down? Right. And what I've learned with, with my friends is we normalize success. We normalize what it is to have it all. That potential isn't an expectation that God ever created for you to live up to that potential is a promise that God created in you to live through. And so now, because I can, I do. And I surround myself with people who also believe the same way because iron does sharpen iron where we can celebrate together because I'm a words of affirmations in person. So you sell, I don't need stuff. I can buy whatever I want. I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I'm a pretty minimalist guy. Like, but you tell me, and if it's, listen, you got to qualify the criticism you got to qualify also, right? You got to qualify somebody's praise. That's right. Because unqualified praise can be just as detrimental as unqualified criticism. That's and right. if you live for somebody's praise, you will die by the criticism. That's right. So, but for me, having that, the, this band of brothers who holds me accountable, checks in on me, checks in on my relationships, checks in on my son, right. checks in on business and, you know, ensures that I'm becoming the man that I say that I'm called to become and vice versa. Likewise. Yeah. Right. There's a real power to that. There's, there's a power that, that I believe every man should look into and needs in his life to, to push past, you know, the propensity of, of mere performance. Yeah. Yeah. The mindset um, that can only come when, when, um, poked, prodded, yeah, rubbed against, created yeah. friction uh, with others. Absolutely, um, yeah. It's it's just as you said, you just don't know un- unless you know. Um, and you made a challenge there that every man, I would say, every business owner, every man yeah. specifically, yeah, should look into it for sure. Uh, and yeah. every business owner, male or female, because yeah. women, you too, listen forward. Talking yeah. to the ladies too. I'm just so used <laughs> yeah. to talking to men. <laughs> no, it's it, it it's good because the yeah. message is clear. There yeah. are certain things that um you know, most entrepreneurs are men. It's because the achievement, ambition, all of that's an energy that usually falls in, um, in a man as a provider. Yeah. Yeah. It's a masculine energy, provide, protect, preside. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Last question here for you. Cody, you've been incredible. Um, I want to know if you had a chance to whisper in the younger Cody's ear, what would you, what would you say? You're worth loving the way you are. Good. Yeah. There's nothing to prove, how to protect. But then again, I don't know that I'd whisper that to myself because I wouldn't be where I am today. Right. And I don't know if a younger version of me would have been ready to hear it or known what to do with it. Or even grab it. Exactly. Yeah. Incredible insight, incredible perspective. Um, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure Same. Uh, to yeah. you know, go back and forth with you here and, yeah. and be stretched and challenged. How can the listener find you? How can they find your community? How can they connect? Yeah, so if you go to OnlyFans, um, no. <laughs> man, I'm easy. Do not to go find. to OnlyFans. <laughs> Do not go there. Bounce your ass. Um, that's the devil's playground. So, right. <laughs> man, you can you can Google me. 
uh, CodyJefferson.com is the website. You can find me on social. Uh, I'm probably more active on Instagram than any other platform. So it's just Instagram, Cody underscore Jefferson. Um, shoot me a message. I and mean, we do get a lot of messages. So, you know, bear with me. Uh, put this podcast as the title. That way, if it goes to my requests, I know where you're coming from. Yep. So I, I make sure to prioritize that and get back to you. I believe we all have a really powerful story. We're just waiting for somebody to hear it. So shoot me a voice message. Let me hear your story and uh, where um, you're going. I love that that you're open on that. We'll put all the socials in the in the show notes. Cool. And of course, easy ways for them to connect with you. You've been incredible. Thank you for going through what you've gone through so that you can share the insights that you have. We wish nothing but blessing you, your son, your yeah. community, everything. Thank you for, for being here today. We appreciate it, Cody. Thanks, brother. Thanks for listening to Gathering the Kings. We hope you got a ton of value today and learned a thing or two about taking your business to seven figures and beyond. If you desire more and want a community around you to help you get there, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. That's gatheringthekings.com. And I want you to apply for our next Becoming a King 90-Day Intensive. We are extremely exclusive by nature as a group. What that means is that we're really wanting only the entrepreneurs who take their business and targets super serious to apply. So if that's you, you think you got what it takes to level up your business, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com and apply. And we will see you on the other side.